and a man settled, settled. There's something settling about a mind fixated on Jesus. There, there, there's something settling about the word of God. And we're going to get into that tonight because God would have us to be settled, settled. Bible study tools tonight are the same as they are every week. We should all study the word of God. That's what the word of God tells us to do, commissions us to do is to study the word of God, to show ourselves approve a workman, <coughs> excuse me, rightly dividing the truth, needing not be in ashamed. So the, the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance is always in order, the Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible Bible dictionary in various Bible translations. Change this setting here. Be careful with the various Bible translations as some translations take away from the word of God. So we have to be mindful and careful of that. And also baby, mindful to take notes. Taking notes is so very, very important. We're students of the word, we're disciples of Jesus Christ. So without further ado, the first question of the evening uh, is a question. If you want to answer it, you can <clears throat> verbally. If you want to unmute yourself, you can. If you want to type it in the chat box, either way, we'll hear or see what you respond. And the question is, what are some examples of God's promises to you and me as believers? Just a brief example any 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 examples of God's promises from his word to us and when um I think it's the Ephesians when it says children obey your parents and then he also says after that um may your days be long on the earth like stuff Amen. like that and um um like um, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Some examples of promise. Yeah, God yeah. will not fail nor forsake you. Amen. Amen. Won't fail or forsake you. Amen. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Those are both great examples. Let's look at the word of God tonight. And let's look into this topic of this subject of being settled and why it's important for us to be settled. First Peter, first Peter five, uh, familiar passage. Um, Starting at verse 5, 1 Peter 5, starting at verse 5, this is in the King James Version, and it reads, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. That's just simple. Resist always also means uh, rejects or is, is, is in opposition to those who are proud. Humble, let's see here, okay. Likewise, ye younger, I'm gonna read that again instead of breaking up. Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Resist means he's in opposition. He does not like pride. Pride is, if you remember, there were three sins that he mentions in the word of God or three categories of sin. Uh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Pride, pride, pride was found in uh, Lucifer, which 
eventually became Satan, adversary, devil, enemy, pride. And so he says he resists, he opposition, in opposition to that, gives grace to the humble. No, well, notice what it says in verse six. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And so now if we know this, our posture, the posture of our heart should to be should be to be humble. Who does that? Who 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 makes us humble? God does. If we yield, yield means if the wind is blowing left, I go left. I, the, the Holy Spirit is blowing me in this direction. I do that. Yield also means that I close my mouth sometimes when God is saying, don't say anything. That means I'm, 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 I'm thankful. That means I remain in a posture of humility. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt that, that he may exalt you in due time. Notice he's the one that does the exaltation. He's the one that'll put you uh, uh, where you need to be. He's the one that does it. Sometimes people try to put themselves in places and they end up getting into trouble. God says, no, you're not to help. You're not, you're not to position yourself. I will, if you would just humble yourselves, I will exalt you. Casting all your peer upon him for he careth for you. That's huge. We miss that. We say that and we, it sounds nice. It's clean, you know, it's just nice to say but we really don't technical difficulties please pray okay still it still, still should be recording is it still recording In the name of Jesus, we just pray over this internet. We pray over the airways, Lord God. We know that you're the God of the miraculous, Lord God. You're above Wi-Fi. You're above signals, Lord God. You, Lord God, sit supreme, Father God. And we just pray right now for better connection, better communication, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, we plead over, we plead over this service. Casting all your care upon him, verse seven, for he careth for you. We have to understand what it truly means to cast our care upon him. That means to throw. That means we shouldn't be carrying anything. So many times I see people, they're carrying things in their backpack that they picked up five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They say they've unpacked it, but they really haven't because they're still carrying it. It's still bogging them down. It's still prohibiting them from walking uprightly. It's still prohibiting them from moving forward as quickly as they could be moving forward. Some people, they would be more advanced in their life if they would recognize the things that were picked up along the way that they need to quickly discard. God says that my, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's what the Lord says. So if I'm carrying something, and it's an unbogged down and it's woe is, woe is me. It's because I choose to. I choose to be bogged down. I choose to continue to carry things. I choose to walk with, a you know, with, with, with these things on my back. Because it says that he is, his burden is easy. His yoke is light. So. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's just simple. Be sober. Not time to get sober. Be sober in the moment. I've talked about this before. I've taught on this. Being sober means not being distracted, not being caught off guard. Sometimes people are not sober when they meet people and they get into relationships that they shouldn't get into. People are not sober when they're making decisions on where they're going to work, where they're going to live, what they're going to do. People are not sober. They're they're in their emotions. Emotions. Notice emotions. You take off if you take off the e, it's motion. Motion. Motion is the opposite of someone that is firm and that is stable. We need to be firm and we need to be stable. We need to be settled when we're making decisions. We need to be settled. What settles us? I'm glad you asked. We're going to get to that in a minute. But we need to make sober decisions, not decisions based on our flesh, not decisions based on our emotions. Be vigilant, watching, because your adversary as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. How does he devour you? How does he get to you? Because you're not operating by being led by the spirit. If we walk in our emotions, if we allow the motions, if we're just Oh, all over the place, then we're, we're susceptible to the enemy. 
we're in danger of being devoured. Verse nine, whom resist steadfast in the faith? How do you resist? Steadfast, steadfast in the who? In the faith. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Worst, worst lie the enemy ever told anyone. You're the only one going through what you're going through. You're the only one that's got it hard. You're the only one that's in this predicament. No, there's actually people that have it 10 times worse and have accomplished five times as much, to be honest. So we have to look at it like that. The distance is not a matter of how much I can handle. It's a much how much the Lord can cause me to overcome. Okay. Can you all still hear me? Okay. So it's not about, it's not about us being able to overcome anything in our own power, in our own might. It's allowing ourselves to yield to the spirit whom you resist steadfast in the faith, knowing this is something that we got to know. We got to know that we aren't the only one. This isn't strange. This isn't, this isn't unique to us. This isn't, oh, oh my goodness. I'm the only, no, everybody's got a story. A lot, a lot, lot worse. Everybody's got setbacks. A lot, lot worse. Everybody had every. Some people had it rougher, and some people had all of these challenges, and yet they overcome. What's the common denominator? Jesus. Notice what it says in verse ten. But the God of all grace, who called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Let me know. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, Sandra says yes. Okay. It's I'm getting a real live updates here with Shantae in the room with me. Okay. Amen. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. Notice the word says suffer. Suffer a while. So there was a purpose in the suffering. And, and, and that's whether it's a self-inflicted wound or it's just something like we're like Job. Sometimes we have self-inflicted wounds and God says, I have to allow circumstances to come about to chastise and punish and to teach you a lesson. And I'll still use that. And there's other times where it's just you just be you just falling into line where I just allowing a test to come about. I'm allowing like Job, the enemy to, to, to tempt you and you to go through trials and tribulation. But nevertheless, the overall purpose is so that we might be made perfect. And perfect is not perfection. Perfect means mature, maturity. When you see the word perfect, we're talking about maturity because nobody was ever perfect but Jesus. Nobody can ever be perfect but Jesus. If anybody were ever to be perfect without Jesus, we wouldn't need the sacrifice on the cross. We could just say, hey, Lord, I got it. I'm, I'm already righteous. Nobody can say that this side of heaven or even in heaven but Jesus. After you have suffered around, make you perfect, establish, establish you, strengthen we need strength so that ultimately we could be settled. Settled also means ground or grounded. Settled. I want us to get that word into our spirit. Settled. Because it's what we're talking about tonight. Being settled. What does it mean to be settled, Pastor Jay? What does it, what does it truly mean to be settled? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 13. Hebrews chapter six, starting at verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee. Multi multiplying, I will multiply thee. 
And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. I want us to understand if you're in the courtroom, if you've ever seen a courtroom, whether it's Perry Mason, Judge Duty, Judge Mathis, you ever see someone say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth, so help me God, or I do solemnly swear that this testimony, they're swearing, they're making an oath to tell the truth by someone higher. That's why people, you hear people say, well, I swear you shouldn't do this, but they say, I swear on my mama, I swear on my mama, great, I swear on my daddy, I swear, I swear, I swear. They're trying to say that they're swearing to something that's higher than them to hold them accountable to what it is that they're swearing to. So if you're in a courtroom and you're swearing on a Bible, which means that you're making an oath before God, if you're God himself, who can you swear by? That's what it's talking about. Who can God swear by? Nobody. That's why it says, it says he swear by himself. Meaning he, 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 he made an oath to himself. He's the highest. So he swore by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee. Multiplying, I will multiply thee. Talking about Abraham, talking about us as well. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Notice the patiently endured came first before the promise. Patiently endured came first before the promise. Patiently endured means that enduring is not I'm, I'm complaining the whole while. Endured does not mean that the whole while I'm complaining, I'm, I'm crying, I'm snotting, I'm rolling all over the floor, I'm telling 15 people, I'm talking about it all day, every day, five days a week, seven days a week. That's the whole, no, 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 no. I will bless the Lord at all times. Even when I'm going through, his praise shall continually be in my mouth, not my complaints, not my misery, not to say that we don't talk to one another within reason and share things so that we can be prayed for or pray for others. But more often than not, our praise needs to elevate above our complaining. We need to be saying something about the Lord, well, how good he is in our life. And so that's why it says after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Notice what it says in verse 16, for verily, Men swear by the greater, an oath of confirmation, oath for confirmation, is to them an end to all strife. It's basically saying an oath, basically, when people swear to an oath, okay, it's like a contract, that's an end to all strife. If there's ever, a, ever a dispute, two people come to the table, they come to an agreement, they say, okay, we swear by whatever contract, we swear by whatever law and everything like that, that we're going to go by, it ends all strife because there's something in writing that holds both people accountable. Verse 17, wherein God more willing abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. The immutability means unchangeability, unchangeable. His counsel does not change, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay, uphold, lay, lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. God gave us a covenant and swore by it. Those things do not change. He doesn't lie and his words don't change. That's what it's talking about. So we have both the promises of God and we have his written word that should settle us. Verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us, enter even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We all know that Jesus is Melchizedek, pre-incarnate. That's a whole nother testimony before a whole nother day about the, the teaching on who, who is that. He has no mother or father. We know that Jesus was, you know, of course, in, in bodily form, he came through Mary and he had Joseph, but Joseph wasn't his daddy. It was God in heaven. And it's talking about he was our high priest. He was always been our high priest. That's why he could be the lamb slain before the foundation of of the world. Why are you slain before the foundation of the world? That's a sacrifice. A sacrifice means that he's giving himself as a sacrifice, which is a priestly duty. Only, only priests would give sacrifice. That's why we saw it mirrored in the new in the in the old testament, where only the high priest would go in once a year with a perfect, unblemished lamb to be shed before uh, a God Almighty. 
to for the atonement of the sins of all of Israel. All of these things kind of parallel. They go together, history and, and spiritual and the revelation. Just a little sidebar. But God is saying it is possible, it's impossible for me to lie, and my promises don't change. They 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 will not change. The prop that nothing can supersede the promises of God. They're unchangeable. Nothing can supersede it. And so with that, that's why it says in verse 19, which hope we have. What hope? The hope in that, the hope in what God has already said. My hope, I don't hope, we don't just hope and hope. We we hope, we're, our hope is in God. Our hope is in the word of God. Our faith is in him. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, sure and steadfast, an anchor. What is the soul? The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. That's why it says in the Bible, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Double-minded, unstable. What settles us? What settles a mind? Something, something, something unchangeable, something solid, something that has a base has to be able to come in, enter in, and settle me. It can't be how I think or feel, because how I think or feel can change in any given moment. That's why we can't be, the Bible says that we have emotions, but it does not say that we are to be led by them. We are to be led by the spirit. So many people are allowed, so many people allow their emotions to lead their decisions. So many people allow their feelings in the moment to lead their decisions. Sometimes people are manipulated by, and they just allow just, oh, willy nilly, their life just floating all over the place. No consistency, no stability, no anchor for the soul. The anchor for the soul is the word of God. It's his promises. That keeps you from moving. If you, if, if, if somebody told you that God was coming to your house and he was going to be there at 3 p.m. And Auntie so-and-so or brother or sister or whoever called and said, I need you to run with me to the store. I don't know what time I'm going to be back. Your belief and faith that God is going to be there at 3 p.m. is going to keep you from going. If the only way it's not is if you're not settled on whether or not he's going to show up or not. And that's what the devil is here to do. He's to get you to thinking and to get you to feeling that what God said in his word is not really true. It's not really something that you can stand. It's not really something that you can stand on. It's not something that you can really take to the bank. It's something that's up for the bait. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Maybe, he did, maybe he'll do it, maybe he won't do it. But if you're settled on the promises of God, and you're steadfast, it becomes an anchor to the soul. Anchors we look at when we think about a boat, when we think about a ship, when we think about roots for a tree. Storms come. But regardless of what the storms, how the storms come, we remain anchored. People remain anchored. That means they, 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 they stand on what they stand on and they don't budge or they don't move. Your principles, your morals, what you what what you believe should not change from week to week, shouldn't change from month to month, shouldn't change from year to year. Some people give it in any moment because we're not settled. Anyone can talk us off of a spot. That's why it says in in, in Ephesians, no longer toss to and fro by every wind of doctrine. People go on the internet and they listen to this and they hear this person and they hear this portion spiritual person and then they hear this person. Everybody on the internet that's got a title, pastor, preacher, or got a church with even with thousands of people in it is not telling you the truth. Everybody that's got a podcast, they're telling you what you want to hear a lot of times because it brings money into the podcast. It brings money into their pocket and hear people, are, well, so-and-so said this and they're blown this way. And so-and-so said this and they're blown this way. Last week they was thinking this about this topic, and this this week they're thinking this about this. Last week they was they were so settled that, that that God is a healer. Now this week they don't really think so much. Last week they were settled. Last month they was thinking, you know what, God is my provider and everything, and He gonna take care of me and everything. And then they get some news, and then they hear something else, and now they're not they're not settled. You can hear it in their conversation. They're not settled. One, it, it sounds like a spiritual schizophrenic. 
God says, I, we, I, I need you to be settled. I need, I need what you're saying today to line up with what you're saying next week. And what you're saying next week to line up with what you're saying next month. I need you to be lined up. Sometimes people are spiritual schizophrenics. And what, 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 what it really is, is when we allow what's around us to get in us. You know, that's a really one of the one of the ways that, uh, uh, of course, a ship, really the only ways that a, a, a ship could really sink. As long as it's not allowing the contaminants or, or, or what's causing it to uh, float to get into it, it's all right. But the moment the things that are surrounding it get on the inside of it is in trouble. It begins to sink. It becomes unsettled. We have to be settled in our thinking, not double minded settled. The enemy has come to give you an unsettling feeling about what you heard, yeah, an unsettling feeling when you hear the news, an unsettling feeling when you go to the doctor, an unsettling feeling when you hear the forecast, an unsettling feeling when you start to thinking, am I always going to be like this? Is God ever going to do it? I know that he did it for so-and-so, but what will he do it for me? He wants you to stay unsettled and he will use your emotions your emotions are a gateway. Not to say that you can't be, you can't have emotions. God gave them to it. That's why he said, be ye angry and sin not. Why would he tell us to be angry? And anger is an emotion. If anger were evil, no, no, no. He said, be ye angry and sin not. In other words, don't allow the anger or the emotion to cause you to be unsettled in your faith. Don't become unsettled. Be settled. Some people would say, uh, say it this way. The whole, the old folks would say, you know, you got to have a made up mind. The enemy is, the enemy cannot penetrate a made up mind. A made up mind means that it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't not matter what's going on. I am going to remain settled in my spirit. Are we settled on the promises of God? We should have this in our minds. We're settled on his word. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. That should settle the matter. We have to ask the question, if we're not settled, then is it possible that what I'm seeing and hearing has become greater than the promise that I believe that he's delivered to me? That's the only reason I'm not settled, is I don't trust God. And so I need to be able to get settled. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Why do you think the Bible says pray without ceasing? Number one, it does two things. We're in constant communication with God. If you remember the, the if you remember the, the the father and the mother who had the child who died and they were going their way to go to go to go see the child, and they they basically said, Why do you trouble us the master? She's dead. And he spoke immediately. Immediately he came up, he said, Fear not, only believe. He was coming to he was he was settling their spirits. He heard the word that they heard, and he knew the effect. The weapons of, the, of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God. The weapons that the enemy uses are words, too. If God spoke into the atmosphere and said, let there be light, and there was, and God says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, who do you think is going to come to you speaking death? Death isn't always that you're going to die. Death is a doubt in God's word. The moment the enemy can get us convinced and unsettled, he's done two things. Number one, he's got us to doubt God, and then he's also been successful at robbing us of our peace. Checkmate. This is spiritual warfare 101. Spiritual warfare 101, and it's going on seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the only way to shut the devil down and to, clump, and, to, and, and, and to calm your flesh, to crucify it rather, is to get settled on his word. 
Let's go to Mark. Let's go to Mark. Mark chapter four. Verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over to the other side. This is Jesus talking. And when he had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. There were also other little ships with him, other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the, weed, and the, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was full. He was in the hinder part. Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. They awake him and say, Master, care is not that we perish. Why was Jesus able to sleep on a pillow in the ship going through the same thing? Notice two things. Jesus never left them nor forsake them. He was right on the boat. How is it possible that Jesus is with me and the storms still come up? How is it possible that Jesus is supposed to be with me and I still get the bad diagnosis? How is it possible that Jesus is with me and I still get the not? How is it possible that Jesus is with me and I'm still going through trials and tribulations? I'm glad that you asked. Jesus does not, the, the, the Bible does not absolve us uh, of, or, or the word of God does not say that we're absolved of going through trials and tribulation. But what it does promise us is that in the midst of trials and tribulation, we could be just as settled as Jesus. Jesus was settled because he had already remembered what he had said. That pillow, if it were, could, could be constructed into a word, if they could have wrote a scripture on it, it would have said, let us pass over to the other side. That's what caused Jesus to sleep. He was settled. Doesn't, doesn't matter what the storm looked like. Doesn't matter what's going on. I'm settled in my spirit on what God has already promised. He's already said that I'm going to the other side. The storm is not greater than the word of the Lord. Do we believe that tonight? If we believe that tonight, then we would sleep a little bit better. If we believe that tonight, then we would cry a little less. If we believe that tonight, we would be a little less frantic when we get news. If we believe that tonight, then the things that are going on in the world would bother us less. We could, because we have a promise from God. We saw the scripture. The Bible says, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. So God, it's like God, if he could, if he could separate himself, I, so I, 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 I swear by myself that I'm going to bless you. I swear by myself that I'm going to cause you to be multiplied. I'm going to multiply you. God said, I, I, I'm not going to lie. And yet sometimes we put God in the same category as man when we, when we well, I, he said, I, I just don't, no, 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 no. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. That should settle it. That should settle the matter. I don't care what demon come up to you lying. I don't care what you hear online. I don't care what you hear from mom and them, auntie, grandma, cousin, even some lying back foot, slew footed preacher that's a lying spirit. You don't care what anybody said. The word of God needs to be the, what, the thing that settles. Ephesians talks about being tossed to and fro. God says, I don't want you to be tossed to and fro. Why? Because... My peace I leave unto you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. The peace that God gives unto us, the peace that Jesus gives unto us, is on a, is, is asleep on a pillow while the storm is arising. Why didn't everybody have the same peace? They all heard the same word. Jesus didn't say, let us pass over to the other side. He said, let us. That means he was talking to them. He was talking to everybody on the boat. Everybody on the boat heard Jesus say that we're going to the other side, and yet only he was able to sleep. Everybody that hears the word of God is not a doer of the word of God. Everybody doesn't trust God. And this is not some, this is not something that, that is outside of yourself. People say, well, well, maybe I just got to be a special type of person. No, 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 no. All you got to do is know how to war. Bible, the Bible says, David said, he teaches my hands to war. I got to, I got to equip you for warfare. The reason why sometimes you're not settled is because you're allowing people to have unsettling comments and statements made around you. Stop having conversations with people that are not settled on the word of God as it pertains to the promises of God. Stop having conversations with people who are wishy-washy. Everybody at church 
It's not going to a teaching church. Everybody's trembling and rocking today, boys, and everything. Nobody, not, not, not everybody's getting a solid doctrine. Not everybody's eating solid food. Not everybody online that is on YouTube or, 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 or Instagram is going to give you a word that settles you. The word of God that settles you is right before you right now. If you've got your Bibles open, which we should, we should, that's what settles you. The only thing that you should be looking for, that's why we say amen. Everything that I'm saying, you're saying amen because it's in the word of God. That's what it means to say when it talks about uh, 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 try the spirit by the spirit. Try means to test. Test means you got the answer sheet. Whatever I, the teacher is saying, which I'm teaching tonight, should line up with your answer sheet. When you say amen, that settles it. Now, anything comes that's contrary to that, if your teacher in school told you, that two plus two is four, and you looked and you counted up the marbles, that two plus two is four, and you didn't and you didn't look at every book official doctrine that says two plus two is four. Why you gonna let your uncle, why you gonna let that crazy joke online tell you what two plus two is really not four? It's really the absence of, of, of 10, which really means that it's five. And if you look at it from this perspective, and all of these different things, the enemy is so cunning and, and so witty and his lying to people. And we become unsettled. Guess what? That's your kingdom inheritance. We do know that peace is your kingdom inheritance. I'm not talking about streets of gold when we get to heaven. I'm not talking about uh, 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 being able to live forever, which, which we do have eternal life. But he wants us to have inheritance right here on earth. He said, I died that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Abundant life is not a big house, big car. Yes, you can have a big house, big car, and still not have an abundant life. Abundant life comes in the form of things that are not tangible, things that you can't put your finger on, things like a peaceful night's rest, things that when you close the door to your house, you just feel the peace of God. No matter where you are, I don't care where you're, this is not about a situation. This is about no matter where you are, I feel the peace of God. I got the joy of the Lord down in my spirit. Come hell or high water, come any bad news or good news or anything in between, I'm going to be like Jesus on the boat. When the storm comes, I'm having a nap. Y'all go ahead and worry and, and, and cry and run from this person to that person. And y'all can do all of this stuff, have 10 conversations and, 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 and be frantic and bite your nails till they come to the cuticles. You can do all of that stuff. But the Lord Jesus that came to die for me, he gave me a peace and I'm going to it right now and right here, baby. This one is. Stop allowing people to get you unsettled. Stop allowing stuff that you hear online to get you unsettled. Stop, stop allowing different things that you hear that are contrary to the word of God, that you should know that are lies that keep you un that keep you unsettled, tossed to and fro. No, be settled. Jesus arose after they woke him up. One of the first things the disciples said, don't you care that we perish? That's man. Lord, don't you care I got these bills? Don't you care I, I, I need this? Don't you care I got this going on? And don't you care they talking about me? Don't you care they treat me like this? Don't you care this going on? This going on? He says, yes, I, yes, I do care. Haven't you read my word? You apparently you, you haven't read my word. My, my word says that before you even utter the words out of your mouth, I already know what you need. That's what the word says. That right there should settle us that when a situation comes about, it's not new news to God. It's new news to us. But we somehow think that God is man and he's sitting up in heaven shocked like, oh, my God, I didn't see that coming. No, he's not shocked. If we are settled in our spirit and we understand that he sees yesterday, today, and forever, he's all, there, there's no blind spots in God. There's nothing in the future that surprises him, and there's nothing in the past that surprises him. He's always been here, and he's intimate and intricate in every single situation of our lives. That, that alone right there should settle us. You know what people say when they get like a security system and, or or they get, you know, you know, the guard dog that's really, you know, or they or they see security rove in the neighborhood and they see, you know, maybe they got a cop station down the way. You know, they say, you know, that that gives me a peace of mind. What they're saying is what they can see, hear, smell, taste or touch gives them a peace. 
But what should differentiate between us and the world is that our word gives us a peace. Our word settles us. That should be our testimony. Jesus arose in verse 39 and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But notice the question that he asked. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, Jesus didn't give him no credit. He said, y'all ain't got no faith. He didn't say y'all got a little bit of faith. He didn't say y'all got, you know, y'all, 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 no, 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 you, you don't have no faith because you woke me up when I already told you that we're getting to the other side. You don't have no faith because you're always cursing yourself. You're always saying, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to this and this world is this and this. You're always cursing yourself. He said, why is it that you have no faith? You don't have no faith. You already planning, you know, when they said this going to happen and the doctor said this, I just might as well go ahead. Why is it Jesus is asking you the same question tonight? Why is it that you don't have no faith? Well, you know, such, 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 this happened in my past and that happened, this, that, that, and it's just, woe is me. No, 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 why is it that you have no faith? Why isn't that you're not talking about the goodness of God today? Why isn't it that you're talking about your bright future, that your windshield is bigger than your rear view mirror? Why is your conversation always in the rear view? Why is it not in the windshield? If the windshield is bigger than the rear view, then the bulk of your conversation should be about what's in front of you, not about what's behind you. We need to be shutting up sometimes and allowing ourselves to get immersed in this word of God. And people should be out and be saying, you know what? 99.9.99999% of the conversation that I ever hear come out of her mouth or his mouth is always about the promises of God. It's always about what he's doing. It's always about how good God is. And if at any time they're ever talking about anything else, they're talking about how things need to be made right, how they can pray about it, how they can get it right between the Lord, how they can pray for other people. Those are the types of things that God would have us to do. Do we really believe that the Lord said in Ephesians 3.20, I will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. Just think of your wildest imagination. He said, I can do above that. Do you really believe that? She said, because if you do, if you really do believe that, then your conversation would match what you believe. People say stuff on Sunday or say stuff on, well, I believe, I trust God. But then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sound like they trust the devil, they flesh and their emotions more than they trust God. Sounds like they trust the economy. Sounds like they trust the bankers. Sound like they trust what's going on on the internet. Sound like they trust what 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 this person says. Sound like they trust everybody else but God, because they're only quoting the people and not God. We need to be some Bible quoters so that we would be settled. God is looking to settle us. Settled. Describe what it means to you when the Lord says that he will, that he is with you. <clears throat> Anybody, you can talk that we can hear you. Type it in the chat box. We can hear either way we can hear or see. <clears throat> Anybody. Donnie, it reminds me of the footprints in the sand. Uh, where it's like you were walking, you saw, you looked behind you, you saw there were two foot sets of footprints. And then when the times are hard, you look there and there's only one set of footprints. And Jesus said, that's because I was carrying you. Amen. Time. Amen. Amen. The things that he's carried me through, praise God. So yes, anybody else? <clears throat> well, I know you were talking about the promises earlier. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I know you were talking about the promises earlier and how he said he'll never leave me nor forsake you. That's what I think about. When Amen. He says he'll never leave. Amen. Never leave nor forsake you. Amen. Praise God. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. And he didn't, he didn't, <clears throat> he did not say that it would never feel like he's not there. But he told us again to be led by our spirit, be led by the spirit, Holy Spirit, rather. Be led by the spirit and not our flesh. Amen. Amen. Praise God, sister. Yes, me too. 
cast out fear. <laughs> First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. <laughs> In the Amplified, verse 58. In the Amplified. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. In the Amplified. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, <clears throat> immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always doing your best and doing more than is needed. Be continually aware that your labor, even to the point of exhaustion <clears throat> in the Lord is not futile nor wasted. It is never without purpose. My God. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast. I love the next word, immovable. I'm still talking about being settled. I'm still talking about being settled. We need to be immovable. Immovable means that regardless of what's said, regardless of what's done, no one can move us off of the spot. If God says that he's with me and he's telling me to do X, Y, Z, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and I'm not going to move from doing it. I'm not going to move from accomplishing it. If you ever looked at the life of Paul, if there was anybody that had more reason to throw in the towel and to quit, you look at the life of Saul. People got it twisted sometimes when we go into ministry and we think that ministry is we sit up in a big church and we, we you know, we sit for Sunday and then we come back and we see each other on Wednesday and that's it. We're not going into no prisons. We're not going to the homeless. We're not going into the elderly show. We're not doing. And then with this other thing that we think that somehow that, that God puts, puts us in this bubble, which he does hedge its sin. If you remember the book of Job, it talks about Job having a hedge and even the enemy brought it up. When Job was tempted by the enemy, it was only because God allowed Job to be tempted by the enemy. Satan came to him and he says, well, <clears throat> he's not praising you for nothing. He's only praising you because you've blessed him. I'm simplifying it. He's praising you. I'll put it in 2024 terms. He's only praising you because he's got that Bentley. He's only praising you because he can look in the bank account and he's praising you on Sunday because every time he's clapping, he's thinking about the million dollars. Every time he clap, he's thinking about that new suit. You know what I'm saying? And so he said he's only praising you for that. But if you if you remove that, if you if you if you if you take something from him, he will curse you to your face. In other words, his testimony will change. He'll find a way to stop coming to church. He won't be telling people walking down the hallway at church. At, 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 at the work, you know, blessed and highly favored. All of that stuff will go out the window if you take away his substance. God allowed it. And he says, well, you know what? Uh, uh, he's got a hedge about him. The enemy confessed that he has a hedge. Well, Job is not the only one that has a hedge. We all have a hedge. God hedges us in. But that does not mean that we don't go through anything. Paul, if you look through his life, he was shipwrecked. He was out in the cold. The Bible said he had forced fastings. Fastings, forced fastings mean he wasn't planning on fasting, but because it wasn't no food, he just went ahead and began a fast. He was hungry. He was cold. He was stoned. He was, he was shipwrecked. All of these things, and yet he was God's man. He was God's anointed. He was in ministry. Some people today would be like, well, God can't be with Job. You know, I say he never leave him or forsake him, but he can't, uh, he, um, excuse me, he couldn't be with Paul because if he with Paul, then Paul would have a little bit more. Paul wouldn't be going through all the hell he's going through. And, and I don't mean hell by the, the enemy, the onslaughts of the enemy. It's just attacking, it's, it's just attacking it. He wouldn't be going through all of that if he was truly blessed of God. But yet God said that he's my chosen vessel. Chosen vessel don't mean smooth ride. Sometimes people think, well, I'm God's anointed. I'm his chosen vessel. And we think smooth ride, like God won't take you some places that you wouldn't necessarily want to go. I'm pretty sure Paul didn't say, Lord, shit, break me anytime. That's not something that Paul had in his periphery. 
He wasn't thinking about being shipwrecked when he was signing up for the ministry. He wasn't thinking about, see, some stuff we weren't thinking about. I wasn't thinking about sleeping in the living room with my mama because she wanted to, he wanted me to spend the last years of her life with her so that she would come to the Lord. And he knew that the only way she would come to the Lord is if her baby started a church and that he was in the house with her. See, we sometimes don't think about the pathway that God going to bring us down. We want to pick the pathway. We want to walk on the road full of roads and we want to we do things the way that we think ministry should go. We think we should have all of these things and go through all and we just want to line up and say now do you want me to do it your way or do you want me to do it my way because according to the word of god the bible says that his ways are higher than our ways his thoughts are higher than our thoughts how in the world are we gonna counsel god when we wasn't there when he hung that sun in the sky god he told joe now when you can tell me how to hang a sun in the sky how to hang stars you trying to figure out this bible and trying to conceptualize and trying to rationalize and trying to go deep in the bible tell me how you make a tree out of nothing i'm not talking about a seed you tell me how you make a tree out of blank air when you can do that then you can start counseling god when you can talk about how you can make a sun out of nothing i ain't talking about with molecules i'm talking about nothing. When you get counsel God on that, he said, then call me up on some of this stuff that you're going through and tell me how it don't make no sense. We have to humble ourselves. But one of the things that cast out fear is when we stop this notion of having to understand what God is doing all the time and just trust what he's doing. Oh, I'll say it again for the people in the back. Stop trying to understand all the time what God is doing and just trust what he's doing. If we trust what he's doing and not have to understand it, we close our mouth a little bit more when we're going through. I, I said it. I, I'm talking to myself, too. Oh, I step on my own toes. I, 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 I preach to myself tonight. If I really trust God, I would stop talking about what I'm trying to understand and what God is doing and just close my mouth and be grateful and thankful that he promised me that I, would, I could trust him in what he's doing. I got to trust him in the process. That way I'm immovable. I'm not tossed to and fro. You talk to me on Monday, and I, my conversation is the same on Friday. And I don't care. I'm going through all hell in a handbasket. My conversation is still the same. My profession is still the same. Brother, I see a little, I see a little, going through a little some God still good. Romans 8, 28 said, all things are working together for my good because I know I, I love him and I'm the called according to his purpose. It might look rough and bumpy to you, but I still want to trust God. I still trust him. Job said, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Do we trust him is the question. The work of the Lord, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always doing your best, doing more that is do, doing more that is needed, exceedingly, but <clears throat> going above and beyond. Do we do that? <laughs> We're not doing that unto man. We're doing that as unto the Lord. <laughs> Excuse me. Being continually aware that your label, even, labor, even to the point of exhaustion in the Lord. Not exhaustion in doing our own thing. Sometimes we get caught up in doing this, doing that. We don't. We're not talking about Mary and Martha. We, you know. You know. You know. One was busy, and the other one was. At the feet of Jesus. She was just busy about doing all of this stuff. She said, no, 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 no. He even told Moses when he was counseling from sun up to sundown. Jethro, his brother and his father-in-law said, the thing that you're doing is not a good thing. What do you mean it's, it's not a good thing? He's counseling. He's on the phone from sun up to sundown. He's talking to people. He's born into their lives. It's not a good thing. You're going to wear yourself out. He told Moses to delegate and come up with other people that could help counsel with him. Sometimes people want to do that. This is like Superman. <clears throat> no, we got to we, we gotta know what, what, what exhaustion means in the Lord. Not in our flesh, not in our emotions, not in a good thing. You got a good idea and you got a God idea. I don't want to, I won't get caught up in doing some good things because we can do some good things and run ourselves into the ground. When we're doing a God thing and yes, we're tired, okay, I can sleep easy at night because I know that I've done everything that he would have me to do. There's a difference. In the Lord, it's not futile nor wasted. So when we're doing it for the Lord and we're in his will, anything and everything that we're doing is not futile nor wasted. It is never 
I want us to get that never. We can underline it, circle it, put a line through it. We can, uh, 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 what I mean by put a line, un underline it, what I mean, and then highlight it, red, circle it, put some dot sparklies all around it. It is never without purpose. Everything that we do for God has eternal purpose. Everything. Man, not, man may not pat you on the back. You may not get an award. You may not get a, 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 a Christian of the year. You might not be on a magazine. You might not be in a newspaper. You might not get accolades. Nobody might ever say thank you, but you can guarantee you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus one day. He's either going to say, depart from me, I never knew you, or he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. <clears throat> Everything else pales in comparison when the Lord Jesus commends you for the work that you're doing. If Jesus commends you, who is man? I mean, really, let's go to 1 John 4.18. 1 John 4.18 in the Amplified. 1 John 4.18. We need to get this wrapping up here in just a moment. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear. Because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. There is no fear in love. Think about that. If you fear someone, and I'm not talking about a reverential fear, the reverential fear is a fear that we 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 you know I I want to respect my 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 parents I I want to I don't want to say anything disrespectful to them because as the scripture uh, uh Christina brought up earlier it says that your days may be long honor thy father and thy mother it doesn't talk about what age you are it says honor thy mother and thy father that cut off at eighteen they didn't have an age limit in the Bible when it says honor no 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 honor thy mother and thy father that thy days may be long so. Honoring is at all times. It says that the days might be long. So the, the the notion is that if you don't do that, your days might be short. And I know people who have left here early from being terrible to their parents, being disrespectful. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. <clears throat> people got this thing sometimes. Well, Lord, forgive me. Yes, he forgive you, but there's still consequences. He forgave you on Calvary's cross over 2,000 years ago. That doesn't mean that he absolves us of consequences. Perfect fear. Excuse me. There is no love. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear. Why? Revelation. I got to have a revelation that the Lord loves me. If I have a revelation that the Lord loves me, that grows into trust. That trust removes all fear that he's going to do something that is detrimental to me. That, 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 that's the relationship that has to take place. And if we don't have it, we gotta, we, we gotta, we gotta question why don't, why don't I, why don't I, why don't I trust God that he loves me like that? Why would I think he would allow this to happen to me to hurt me? Why would I think that he would allow this to happen to me to, to do this? Now, some things we bring into our lives and we blame God. I lost my money over here because I did this. Well, you, you did that. God didn't. You, 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 you didn't pray. Well, he treated me like this and he did, you did that. You can't blame that on God. Well, she did this to me and she did that. She, you, you, God didn't do, you did that. He's not a man <clears throat> that he should lie. And he says, I set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, choose life. But if you choose death, if you choose, if you choose people, places and things that are detrimental to you, he has to allow you to choose those things and allow you to reap the repercussions of choosing bad choices. Doesn't mean that he doesn't love you any less. He loves you enough to allow us to choose. Perfect, perfect, perfect love is when I understand that when I do it his way and I'm in his will, doesn't mean that things won't happen. Doesn't mean that I won't have trials or tribulation. But what it does mean that I will release myself from having to understand 
and I will settle myself in knowing that it's working together for my good. I settle myself in trusting God. I settle it. it doesn't, you know what? I'm going through this right now, but God got me. I, I, I might be, this might be happening all the way. I, I don't know. I don't understand this. It's not for me to understand. I just want to trust him. I just trust him. <clears throat> I need to be settled. Job's friends were people who were around him, or they call them friends in the Bible, but I don't think they're friends. They were unsettled. You know why they were unsettled? Because they thought that Job had done something. Surely you did this or you did that or something could happen. All of these scenarios that they were throwing at Job to get him to thinking that somehow he, you know, he had to get something right or he had to do something another thing. And that's unsettling. I'm not talking about people who are telling you the truth, because there are sometimes we choose wrong and we don't want to hear those people that are telling us that we need to stop choosing like that. We need to stop doing this and stop doing that and start making better decisions and change this and change that and, and be more disciplined in this area and be more. I'm not talking about those people. Those people love us. That's love. Carnality would say, I don't want to hear them. Immaturity would say, I ain't listening. But that's love. We need to drive out fear with our perfect revelation of the father that loves us. Psalms, Psalm 23, one of my favorite Psalms. Psalm 23, verse four. I'm talking about the shepherd. This is in the King James. We know that the Lord is our shepherd, but look at what the Psalmist David said. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, did God say, I'm going to, I'm going to absolve you from having to walk through things that are scary to you. I'm going to, I'm going to absolve you from walking in seasons of your life where it looks like all, all things are going to, the, the walls are going to cave in on you. I'm going to absolve you of that. No, no, no. I got to, I got to know that you trust me. And the only way that I know that you trust me is if I allow you to go through situations that shakes you in your in your emotions, shakes you in your flesh. I need you to be led by the spirit. Yay. <clears throat> Another translation would be, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What would cause David to not fear any evil? He just gave an illustration. This is Psalm 23 talking about the shepherd and the sheep. He's like, I, I don't, I don't fear because I trust the shepherd. Notice what it says in the very next line. Thou art with me. Those sheep, because of the shepherd, they don't care if there's a wolf nearby. My shepherd got me. It looked like the wolf about to come over here and pounce. It looked like this about to happen. My shepherd didn't show me too many times. The enemy is no match. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Staff to pull you back in and the rod to beat that old raggedy snagged tooth wolf right over the head. Correction and protection all in one hand and all in both hands. Rather. <clears throat> thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you have a revelation that God is with you? And last scripture of the night. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10 in the King James. Isaiah 41, verse 10 in the King James. Fear not, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Another translation of dismayed means to be discouraged. Be not be dismayed. Be not be. Don't be discouraged. Stop holding your head down because you, you. We get news and it's like okay. We must take the news as true, and the word of God is a lie because it changed my disposition. If I'm settled, doesn't matter. For I am the Lord. For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Sometimes we act helpless. We hear stuff and we like, well, I, 
No, his promise to you is that he's going to help you, regardless of what you just can, regardless of what you just heard, regardless of what they said, regardless of what they did, regardless of whatever it is. He's saying, I will help you. I will help thee. So now I'm looking for his, his help. Lord, I'm looking for your help. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't have to understand how you're going to work it out. I don't have to put it all together and put all the calculations. If you got to do all of that, then you don't need a God because you got it. He said, I need to be God in your life. God means that I'm bigger than your situation. I can take on more than what you can take. You have to have something to be able to cast on me if I am to be truly your Lord. And if you're already carrying it and you want to carry it, then you and then you can't cast it, then you put yourself on the throne. I'm sorry, I'm more settled when he's on the throne. When I just give it to him, how many people like to just go in the store and it's that electronic department or you got that AC that went out, you don't know what you're doing or anything and you just tell him the thing and you just give it to him and you just, what, you settle. Because you know the expert in the room. They're there to fix it. How much more God? God is saying, if you could push an AC on man and just be settled and just as cool and calm, oh, he got, he going to fix it. I ain't, you know, I'm just like, if we could push issues and problems off on a doctor, oh, well, I know they're going to they figure it out. They're going to work it out. And then we get to God and we give him something and then we still, God like, really? You bite your nails over here with me, but you was cool, calm, and collected when you told a mechanic your problem and you were settled. His word more powerful than mine in your life. Isn't that something? Do you think that God that, that makes God feel good? The Bible says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We think grieving the Holy Spirit is when we're doing something that we ain't got no business doing, watching something, doing something. No, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we don't trust him like we should. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we don't believe the promises of God over the words of man. God is hurt. Don't, don't you trust me? Why, why are you carrying on like that? Didn't I tell you? So you don't believe what I said? Can you can, 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 now, now, just put yourself in the frame of God now? And your child, and you told them that you got a you got you, you got dinner ready for them when they come home. And when they come through the house, you can see that they've been crying and everything. You see they got half a sandwich. And they tell you, well, well mama, well, well, daddy, I didn't know if you was going to feed us tonight. And, and I, was, I was worried and I was crying the whole day. And I just got this sandwich out of the garbage can because I didn't know if you was going to provide for me. How would that make you feel as a parent to know that your child dug in the garbage because they don't trust you enough to make a meal that night? They went in the garbage and got a half a nasty, filthy sandwich because they don't trust your word. That would make you feel lower than dirt. And yet we do God the same way. I made a Bible full of promises. And there are some times when I don't think that you believe me. Sometimes you're like that kid rummaging through the trash, bringing a dirty old filthy sandwich home because you didn't trust me to make you a meal. The way that it breaks your heart is the same way that it breaks the heart of God. We need to stop doing it. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Verse 11, behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. They that strive with thee shall perish. We're not even worried about our enemies. We don't even be fearful about our enemies. He said, they that strive with you, they that try to come after you, they that try to bother you, they're going to be as nothing. They're going to perish. Verse 12, thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contended thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of not. When you come coming against opposition, you ought to start getting excited. Okay, my daddy about to kick in. You better leave me alone. You better back out the way now. I know my daddy, if you don't stop bothering me, my father in heaven is going to get angry. He's the one that's coined the frame. He's the one that said in his word, touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. And guess what? Everybody through Jesus Christ is anointed. 
Oh, not just the preachers and the pastors and the deacons. I'm talking everybody, everybody that's got the anointing of God on the inside of them is anointed. He cares about each and every one of us. That's why he says, be careful that you don't bother one of these little ones which believe in me. It would be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and jump into the middle of it. He wasn't just talking about kids. He wasn't just talking about little children. He was talking about his children, the children of God, you and I. Verse 13. For I, the Lord, thy God, will uphold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not. I will help thee. Fear not. He says it again. Why does he keep saying fear not? Because he know men are some fearful people. Well, we got to get out of that. Fear not, thou worm of Jacob, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The Lord promises to always be with us and that that being with us ought to bring assurance, ought to settle us. And we should never be in fear. Cast it out with the revelation of what God has already promised. And it should settle us. We should be settled. Amen.